In the 1960s, a, a religious phenomenon swept across the American landscape and, and spread to several countries throughout the world. It was a fascination, indeed a preoccupation with Bible prophecy. More specifically, it was a newly acquired conviction that it was possible and imprudent to discern the precise details of the end times. Prior to this, Bible-believing Christians certainly affirmed that Jesus was coming again. But there was widespread consensus that the genre of scripture referred to as apocalyptic literature was intentionally ambiguous. And that attempts to discern the exact meaning of apocalyptic signs and images in such books as Revelation and Daniel were fruitless. Suddenly, however, a, a new breed of prophecy expert emerged from a wing of the evangelical church who weren't afraid to tackle those complicated texts and provide detailed analysis and bold interpretations accompanied with predictions of when and where and how the end times would unfold. Words and symbols such as rapture, the great tribulation, pre-tribulation, millennium, antichrist, beast, and 666 became part of the Christian vernacular. During a period of instability and unrest, these experts opened up our imaginations to a new and exciting way of interpreting contemporary events and global personalities, a way that appealed to some who previously had no real interest in Scripture. And, and it triggered a consciousness that Jesus could come at any time for the church. Indeed, these prophecy experts argued that the signs indicating his imminent arrival had been fulfilled when Israel regained its status as a nation in 1948. The retaking of Jerusalem in the 1967 war between Israel and its Arab enemies only further confirmed that Jesus was on the verge of coming back. End times experts declared that sometime within the span span of a generation, however long that is, the rapture would occur, the Antichrist would appear, a seven-year period of tribulation would unfold, and, and finally Christ would return to establish his kingdom on earth for a thousand years. But alas, even by the most generous definition. It's been longer than a generation since Israel became a nation. Furthermore, none of the personalities who were identified as the Antichrist or the beast, and none of the predictions about the mark of the beast have been accurate either, which raises some questions. Were these prophecy experts misguided? Did they take unwarranted liberties in their interpretations of Daniel, Revelation, and other prophetic passages of Scripture? More importantly, what does God think about the efforts of Bible teachers who make specific predictions about the return of Christ? The second coming of Christ is indeed a major emphasis in the New Testament, and the biblical writers clearly portrayed it as the pinnacle of the believer's hope. It is what we are living for, for it marks the beginning of when we start to really live. It marks the end of the reign of sin and Satan in this earth realm, the end of our sin-cursed hearts and minds and bodies and the beginning of when all things will be made new and right, an existence where there will be no sin 
no struggle, no fear, no death. The believers at Thessalonica got really excited about that. However, when Paul told them that Jesus could return at any time, they really believed that he would. And as time went on and he did not, they became confused and troubled, especially when some things happened that they didn't expect, like the deaths of some of their believing loved ones. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Verses 13 to 18, the passage we studied last week. Paul asserts that believers who die before the second coming of Jesus will most certainly not miss out on the parousia. Their decayed and disintegrated bodies will be recomposed and resurrected. And along with believers who are alive at the time, they will ascend together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. In chapter 5, Paul continues his instruction on this subject. However, whereas in chapter 4 he focuses on the fate of deceased believers at the parousia, in this section he emphasizes the need for living believers to be ready for Jesus' imminent return. Verse 1, 1 Thessalonians 5. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. Paul is answering another question raised by the Thessalonians on the subject of the parousia. This one having to do with the question of when. As we read on in the passage, we discover that the question arose out of more than just curiosity. They were concerned about their own participation in the parousia. They were wondering if by being morally or spiritually lax, the Lord might consider them to be unworthy, inadequate, or ill-prepared to be summoned to meet the Lord. Perhaps they wanted to know if there were any signs that would give them some advance warning that the parousia was about to happen so they could be fully prepared. But no such information was available. Indeed, Paul says there was nothing that could be written, as we discover in verse 2. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Apparently, Paul had already given the church some oral instruction on this matter when he was with them in person. And he reminds them that they already knew all there was to know about the timing of Jesus' return. Now, of course, it's natural to want to know exactly when the big event will be. But the fact is, we cannot know, which means that there is really no such thing as a prophecy expert. Those who have claimed to figure out exactly when Jesus returns are being presumptuous. When Paul was asked for more details, even he had nothing more to say than what he says in this passage. And Bible teachers today would do well to follow his example. Paul says that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. What is the day of the Lord? Some have made a distinction between the day of the Lord and the parousia referenced in the previous chapter. They insist that Paul is describing two different events. They assert that chapter 4, verse 17 is a reference 
to the church being raptured and taken to heaven and that there is a seven-year gap called the Great Tribulation that will occur before the day of the Lord. I would humbly submit to you that is not the natural, the natural, most simple way of reading the text, which is another rule of hermeneutics. A person would have to do a number of exegetical maneuvers to come up with that interpretation, for there is nothing in Paul's reference to the day of the Lord to suggest that he was distinguishing between the events of chapter 4 and chapter 5. Remember, chapters are a much later addition. These are comments that were made just almost in the same breath. I believe that the day of the Lord was one as, and the same as the parousia. Paul was simply borrowing a frequent and familiar Old Testament phrase that signified the day on which God would act in power to establish his sovereign rule on earth. A day that would involve both judgment for the unbeliever and salvation for the believer. And since Paul wanted to emphasize judgment for unbelievers in the next few verses, it is only natural that he would use this phrase, the day of the Lord. But Paul's real emphasis in this verse is on the manner in which this day will arrive. He says, it will come like a thief in the night. Jesus himself used this simile when he said, but understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect I believe this figure of speech, a thief in the night, is intended to convey three things. First, Jesus' coming will be unexpected. A burglar typically does his devious work under the cover of darkness when the household is sleeping, oblivious to the fact that there is an intruder in the home. Likewise, Jesus' coming will take the world by surprise. Second, his coming is unpredictable. That's what Jesus meant when he said, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. Indeed, a thief can only be successful if no one knows he's coming. In the same way, Jesus' coming will be as unpredictable, as surprising as a thief's. Third, the thief in the night figure of speech is intended to convey that Jesus' coming will be unwelcome by some. Obviously, a burglar is an unwelcome intruder, not an invited guest. Many of those living on earth at the time of the parousia will find that the day of the Lord is a day of judgment, and therefore it will be an unwelcome, unpleasant event. Look at verse 3. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. In Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus told his disciples that there would be signs indicating that the time of the end was getting near. He said there would be wars 
and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation. There will be famine and pestilence and earthquakes. There will be an increase of persecution and martyrdom for Christians. There will be an epidemic of hatred and strife and betrayal and faithlessness. You might have noticed those are not signs of peace and security. How is it then that Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5 describes a scenario scenario where people will say, ah, peace and security, everything is fine, all is well. In 1930, President Herbert Hoover made an astonishing announcement to the American people. He said, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to inform you that the recession is officially over. If you know anything about American history, you know that the Great Depression and its worst part wasn't until at least two years later. More recently, in May of 2003, President George W. Bush gave his mission accomplished speech aboard the USS Abraham Lincoln, declaring that victory in the war against Iraq had been won. In actuality, as you know, that war was just beginning. And in January of this year, President Trump declared that there was absolutely no need to worry about the coronavirus, confidently asserting, quote, we have it totally under control. It is not uncommon to think that things are better than they really are. It is not uncommon to completely misinterpret the actual state of things or to be deceived by a false sense of peace and security. All of the things Jesus referred to in Matthew 24 are occurring right now. And yet many are presently declaring peace and security. Both Jesus and Paul said that at a time that, seem, that, that many will, will perceive to be well, secure, destruction will arrive with the suddenness of labor pains. We all know that labor pains are unbearably painful. But Paul's emphasis by using this figure of speech is not on the pain but on the way in which the birth pains come upon an expectant mother, more or less without warning. He's also emphasizing that judgment is inevitable. You know full well that a pregnant woman who is two weeks overdue sincerely wonders if she will ever have her baby. But no woman in that state has ever failed to eventually give birth. Likewise, it may feel to the unbeliever that Jesus' promise to return to judge the earth is an empty promise, given the fact that it's been 2,000 years. But it will happen, and it will be catastrophic for those who will suffer his wrath. Jesus said in another place that it would be so terrible that people would cry out for the mountains to fall on them and the hills to cover them, to hide them from the wrath of God. But Paul's major emphasis in these verses in the first part of 1 Thessalonians 5 is not on the judgment of unbelievers, but on the way that believers need to be prepared 
for the day of the Lord. And so he says in verse 4, But you, you Thessalonian believers, are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. The images of light and darkness and day and night are often used in Scripture to designate insiders versus outsiders. Those who are friends of God versus those who are enemies of God. Those who have a knowledge of the truth versus those who are ignorant of the truth or who have rejected the truth. Here Paul is saying that because followers of Jesus belong to the light, they have nothing to worry about. The day of the Lord will not come as a dreadful surprise to them. It will not have the character of a thief, but of a friend. So even though it is impossible to know precisely when Jesus will return, Paul wants to assure the Thessalonians and us that it will be a happy event for them. They can enthusiastically look forward to it because it will be the day when they shall inherit their salvation. But Paul goes on to say that while the question regarding the time of the parousia cannot be answered, what does matter is being prepared for it. And so he says in verse 6, So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. Unlike unbelievers who sleep in ignorance and thus will be caught off guard by the coming of the Lord, believers are to keep awake and be sober. Keeping awake is a figure of speech that emphasizes the need to be spiritually alert. Look, Paul understands the human tendency to become lax over time. But he knows that when we are spiritually lax, we become vulnerable to discouragement, temptation, the allurements of the world. And if we succumb to those things, we can lose sight of what we are really living for and thus be unprepared for the Lord's coming. The Apostle John put it this way, and now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. The second word in verse 6 is translated, be sober. And it certainly suggests a state of mind and being that is the opposite of being drunk. But in this context, it is referring to spiritual sobriety rather than physical sobriety. Paul is contrasting those who are spiritually inebriated, those who are out of touch with reality, who have no idea of what is going on in the spiritual realm and are therefore unprepared for the day of the Lord. To those who are spiritually sober, those who do know what is going on in the spiritual realm, those who are living for the day when Jesus comes to finish his work of salvation. Paul is exhorting the Thessalonians, to keep their spiritual wits about them so they can be fully prepared and ready for the big day. In 1979, 
the day after Mindy and I were engaged to be married, I flew to British Columbia for the summer to work as a short-term missionary on an Indian reserve. That was an agonizing experience for me, primarily because I was so lonesome for Mindy. I didn't think that summer would ever end. The days dragged on and the, and the weeks seemed like months. I, I found myself living for the day when we would be reunited. And as that day grew near, I made plans and preparations so that everything would be just so. Remember, this was the day when there were no cell phones, no emails, no contact other than letters. And I think I talked to Mindy one time on phone during that summer. The plan was for her to come to Canada with my parents and meet me at a predetermined spot in the little town of Chimanus on Vancouver Island. They would be driving a rented motor vehicle, motor home, and they expected to arrive about six o'clock in the evening. I started getting ready at six o'clock that morning. I was living on a small island with no running water, so I took a ferry to another small island to take a rare and badly needed shower. I scrubbed for at least 45 minutes. I brushed my teeth three times. I combed my hair just the way she liked it. I splashed a generous portion of aftershave on my face and tucked a pack of breath mints into my pocket. When I put on my shirt, I rolled up my sleeves so she would notice my bulging biceps. Then I took the ferry to Chimanus and arrived at three o'clock in the afternoon. I didn't want to be late and I didn't know if they might be early. So I got to that predetermined meeting place and took my position on the curb. And I began to wait. I stood there and waited. I didn't dare sit down because if Mindy came around the corner and saw me sitting, I thought she might interpret that as a lack of excitement. And so I stood. I stood on a six-inch curb. Across the street in the top of a two-story house, a, a woman kept peering at me from behind the blinds. Finally, she opened her window and threatened to call the police if I didn't stop loitering. I, I smiled and waved and refused to budge. Nothing was going to deter me from this reunion. At 10 p.m., Seven hours later, I was still standing on the curb. By that time, I was disheveled. My legs were stiff. My back was sore. A strong sea breeze was blowing and had messed up my hair. My aftershave had worn off and I had run out of breath mint. It was so cold that my biceps had turned blue and were covered with goosebumps. But I had a, another, more pressing problem. I was feeling the call of nature. Finally, when I could stand it no longer, I left my post and sprinted, sprinted to the nearest public restroom. And when I came out no more than two minutes later, I discovered Mindy had arrived and was looking everywhere for me. I believe there is a good way to measure how important someone is to you when you are anticipating a reunion or an encounter with that person. You can measure it by what lengths you are willing to go, what measures you are willing to take, what sacrifices you are willing to make to be fully attentive, alert, and ready.
Of course, that is not difficult to do when that person means the world to you. Peter said in his first letter, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Friends, what are you living for? What are you setting your hope on? With the departures of two loved ones in our church this week, I have been reminded of Peter's statement that we are strangers and foreigners in this world. This world is not our home, and therefore it is fruitless to be consumed and preoccupied with the things of this world. Real hope is in the Lord, and that hope is to see him face to face, to be in his presence without the limitations and constraints of these earthly bodies we live in, without the hindrances of our flesh. Our hope is to be able to have sustained, uninterrupted fellowship with him for all eternity, where we shall never cease to praise him for his incredible love and mercy and grace, where we shall never cease to marvel at his incredible beauty and glory. All of that begins when Jesus comes. Look at verse 8. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Once again, let's be careful not to read our theology into the text. When Paul says that God did not destine or appoint us to suffer wrath, he's not referring to the great tribulation, the seven-year period spoken of in Daniel. He's referring to God's judgment, which will condemn unbelievers to hell for rejecting his provision for their salvation in Jesus. Notice, the reason that Paul says we will not suffer wrath is because of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. Our salvation is rooted in what Jesus did for us on the cross. Had he not died for us, had we not appropriated his death by putting our faith in him, we too would be destined to suffer wrath. The point is, our eternal security is grounded in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ for us. When he died for us, he purchased us with his blood and nothing can change our status as belonging to him. So, whether, so when he comes, whether it is in the daytime and we are awake or whether it's in the middle of the night and we are asleep, he will take us to be with him so we can live with him forever. And that's the best news of all. We get to be with him for eternity. Verse 11, therefore encourage one another and build one another up 
just as you are doing. I started this message by describing the bold assertions that many self-proclaimed prophecy experts made in the 60s and 70s and 80s about the timing of Jesus' return. I want to make a bold assertion of my own. The passages of Scripture that deal with the end times and the parousia were not written so that we could know the precise time of Jesus' coming. They were given to encourage weak and weary saints who needed to be assured and who needed to get prepared. Here's the specific encouragement that Paul is giving in this passage. First, for the unbeliever, the day of the Lord will be a sudden, unexpected, and unwelcome surprise because it will be a day of judgment, a day in which they will begin to experience the wrath of God. Our response to that unpleasant fact ought to be a, to live with a sense of urgency to share Christ and the good news with those who don't yet know him. For when he comes, it will be too late for them to respond. Secondly, for believers, the day of the Lord is a cause for eager anticipation, not fearful apprehension because it is not a day of wrath or judgment or destruction for us. It is the day of our salvation, a day in which we will meet the Lord and begin living with him forever. And then third, the way to prepare for the day of the Lord is to live as though he may come back today. And he might. He might. We prepare by walking in the light as he is in the light, to be vigilant and to set our hearts and minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. In this present earthly existence, it's not how long you live, but how well you live. It's not how many toys you accumulate, how many adventures you have, how many friends you make, how much power you possess, how wealthy or healthy or pretty you are. It's about seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. It's how you invest your time and energy and resources for his pleasure and his glory. Friends, we exist for Jesus, for by him and for him all things were created. And the climax of our existence is when we see him face to face. Life on this earth is only a shadow of reality. It's merely a preparation for when we start to really live. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this encouragement. Thank you for this assurance. Thank you that believers don't have to live in dread about the day of the Lord. Thank you that we get to be in your presence. Father, I do want to pray for our loved ones that don't know Jesus yet. It's our longing. It's our desire. In fact, Lord, you know for most of it, it's our greatest longing that they would come to know you before it's too late. So, Lord, soften their hearts. Penetrate their hearts 
with the truth about Jesus. Reveal yourself to them so that they can know you. Father, for those of us who do believe, I pray that we would never become spiritually lax or lazy, but that we might be alert, ready, prepared to meet you at any time. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name.